Am I joined? Can you guys all join the meeting, please? Good evening. And I call the March 9th Board of Education meeting to order. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? President, I move that the board approve the March 9th, 2020 agenda. Second. Please move on that. Mm -hmm. All right, report of board members. I got to go with the Norfleet kindergartners to the Nelson Atkin Museum and of Arts. But that may sound sort of odd that, I mean, it doesn't quite go together, you know, for kindergartners, but they were ready for us. The kids got to paint and they got to use pastels and crayons and, or scissors and glue. And, and then we went on a shortened uh, trip through the um, museum and it was really great. It, it was a day, I guess, of kindergarten, first and second graders because there were many clumps of kids and it had been a long time since I'd been on a field trip bus, but they're still the same. So <laughs> I was glad to find that out. <laughs> they're still the same. And then Norfleet finished up their um, week of literacy celebration with a Chris Cakes pancake breakfast Saturday, and, and that was fun. So, um, I had the privilege of uh, going over to Blue Ridge Elementary uh, and reading to a first grade class and fifth grade class. It's pretty exciting. Uh, I got reminded about onomatopoeias and stuff like that, and that's really a fun word to say, evidently. And um, looking forward to. Uh, Visiting with Dr. Moore, uh, going to try to visit all schools. So I got to do that last week. Um, I it's been a busy run, boy. Um, I got to go to Raytown High's play. I had to look that up because it's felt recently, but it was almost yeah, it was the 21st. That was a great um, our town made me cry. So thanks a lot, Katie. <laughs> And then um, I got to go to the Night of Jazz. Um, was that just last week? That was just last week. Um, so to hear all the middle school and high school jazz ensembles, we have some pretty great and talented kids out there. So um, it's been fun to listen to how much they've progressed over the years. Um, and then I got to go to the basketball game. Was that Friday night? Friday mm -hmm. night? Yeah, mm -hmm. up at Raytown High. So not quite the ending we wanted, but. Um, yeah, I don't like Blue Springs stuff, so <laughs> yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so, it was good. All right, I have a couple things to share. You know, I went to the South Plain. It was really good, and we wanted to ask Dr. Marco to spell any words tonight. Right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I do want to thank everyone, all the, the kids and staff at all schools for all the the great uh, cards and letters and gifts they gave the school board for, for appreciation. Uh, I was also at Blue Ridge last week and read to a couple different classes and also uh, I like to uh, be in the cafeteria with the kids, especially the kinder kindergartners, that's always fun. So don't forget board, you know, you have that opportunity you know, to really get a good feel of what's going on in school by eating in the cafeteria, especially the kindergartners, they're the fun ones. So. They always tell the truth, <laughs> <laughs> except for about my age. Then, they, yeah. Yeah, then I don't quite tell the truth on that one. I was, I was, I'm glad that the board still, uh, uh, the board and the administration still do academic 
awards uh, night and that we honor our kids that way. And last week was a, well, you know, last week we did that and it was another great night, a lot of great kids and looking forward to all the things they're going to go out and do. Uh, and I do want to mention one other thing and sometimes we have things that aren't quite uh, literal education issues, but uh, we were having an issue at three trails with some neighbors and a parking situation over there and you know people parking where they're not supposed to and causing problems with the neighbors on both streets and I had some complaints about that and I just wanted to recognize Travis and Kim and I don't know if Tara's here tonight but all you guys that worked together to get that problem solved and I had a neighbor contact me and say it's totally different there now so I appreciate you guys getting that that worked out all right that's all I have for now. Anybody else? All right. Superintendent highlights. A couple things. One, I know it's not on the, the did you know, but uh, for the third year in a row, I believe the Herndon Culinary students won the state championship again uh, in the culinary competition. We are on to Washington, D.C. in uh, June, May, June? May. May. Uh, to take on uh, the rest of the United States. So we're excited about that. Um, thinking back to a former graduate, Otis Peeler, of South High School, it's been three years ago, I think, since he's graduated, but he just won the 184-pound division national championship in wrestling for the National Junior College Association. So congratulations to, to Otis. He uh, wrestled for Cowley Junior College. South High Speech and Debate, Justice Thompson, Derek Porter have qualified for the Nationals. And then we do have a basketball game tomorrow night. South High School travels to Lee Summit High to play Grandview. Uh, South won their sixth district championship in a row last week and are on quite a run with this group of boys. So that game is at 745. We have STEM in the gym at 6 and you can go uh, get your science intake and then hustle on over and support our boys. Uh, we win there. it will be quarterfinals. Let's just win there. Let's win there and then we'll go to the next one. So we're excited about that. That's it. All right. Did you know? have a save the date for teacher of the year and support staff employee of the year ceremonies. We have already, our buildings have selected their 2021, yeah, 2020, 2021, seems like so far away, but it's not. Uh, teacher of the year and support staff of the year nominees. Our teacher of the year interviews are actually going to take place this Thursday, uh, and that breakfast will take place the morning of Thursday, April 2nd, and then support staff interviews will take place the evening of Thursday, April 2nd, and that breakfast will take place on Thursday, April 9th. Um, and so uh, in our patron update and quality update that recently went out, we listed those nominees and, and will continue to do so. Um, we have a partnership with Advanced Eye Care and our total of 160 students from uh, five elementary schools will be served. They will receive eye exams and then if they need classes, they will receive classes through that partnership. <laughs> The Southland CAPS program, that's Education Exploration Program, they recently completed, it competed in the Educators Rising State Competition in Columbia, Missouri, and a total of 12 of the 14 students placed in the top five in their respective divisions, and they're now going to attend the national competition in Washington, D.C., which is June 17th through the 21st. The Greater Kansas City Counselor Association recently nominated Dr. Cheryl Reichert, uh, Herndon Career Center Director, and Nate Zaire, a Herndon Career Center Counselor, as the Administrator and Counselor of the Year for that organization. So that's really nice. And um, board member Mr. Rick Tony recently completed his uh, board member refresher training. And we have a certificate for Mr. Tony as well. I watched a video for an hour, <laughs> but, but I, and in all fairness, this, this was a great video. This is a, a very serious subject about uh, stalking in the schools, and, uh, and it, it will, it's something everybody should, um, should watch because it is an extraordinarily serious problem, and, um, and my heart goes out to the kids who um, 
who have to deal with, with that sort of pain. So uh, it was more than a bit, an hour video. It was really an experience. Anyway, uh, uh, thanks for the recognition. I appreciate that. Any questions for Danielle or anything? I have a quick question, Brian, Danielle or Brian, on Southland Caps on this competition. Who, who were the kids and what was their actual uh, subject that they were competing in? I will say it was all Raytown kids but one. Six from Raytown High, five from South High, one from Raytown. And so we just have the one categories. I, I am I know that there were uh, you know it's all related to education and they go through type, like interview types of scenarios <laughs> along with some at <coughs> project like performance event types things. I don't know specifically. Marlene, you yeah, want to speak? Marlene can speak to it as well because she interviewed some of students. Oh, good. I served as a judge. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. So what I did was interview. Um, some high school students that were applying for a fictitious instructional assistant job. They submitted resumes and they submitted cover letters. And then there were different categories that they did different things in. I think there was even one where they wrote a children's book and things like that. So it was all education related um, topics. And since we're, you know, teachers are really in short demand, so these type of activities where we can encourage our young people to become teachers we're going to continue to really focus on. So it was our first time I think we've done that. And they were competing against other, other school districts? Or? All over the state. All over the state. Yes. So we got several kids headed to D.C. for the yeah. Board of Superintendent, Dr. Mark. Before we go back to the Health Service Baptist Trinity Lutheran no. Grant, or can you speak to that? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Shirley Early is with me this evening, and she'll speak to that. Thank you. For health services, each year we try to put in supports for our students to make sure that they are advancing in our classes and they don't have things that. Uh, hold them back and so we apply for a grant every year to get some added resources to check their vision and their hearing and their asthmatic and keep out with supplies in our club and as you just heard i'm going to be riding the bus again with a hundred and some kids so uh, and it is going to be a field trip all day so i'm going to ask them and uh, Trinity Baptist, Baptist Trinity Lutheran Grant Foundation to come on up. <laughs> That's a lot to get out sometimes. And they're going to talk to you about the grant and what we spent the money on. Great. I'm just going to say a few quick words. For anybody who's been in this community for any length of time, you might remember Baptist Medical Center and Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Um, they, of course, were nonprofits that sold to a for profit hospital. Um, and so those nonprofit foundation assets that most nonprofit hospitals have, those have to spin off and become their own nonprofit, and that's what we are. Um, so this program is a, is a three-year-old program. So far, we've given away about a half a million dollars um, to 11 different school districts, and, uh, and this year we added two charter schools. Um, so this is my 10th school board meeting this year. <laughs> I'm, I'm rivaling you all. And I do want to say one quick thing about your board. I have never heard in the other ten I've been, or another nine to, I've, another nine I've been to this year, no one's ever said, I went and read to kids, I went on a field trip. I've not heard that in any other district. So you have a lot to be proud of here because that's really, I think, unusual. Maybe they just say it at a different time, but um, but I really think that that's awfully cool. Can we um, get a grant for that? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so just a couple other quick things that we do. Uh, we have nursing scholarships, so if you know anybody in nursing school or planning to go to nursing school, you can send them to our website. Uh, we also um, run a medical conference, and we have a program called Kansas City's Medicine Cabinet that helps people um, living at or above 200%, at or below, I should say, 200% of federal poverty level, helps them access things like glasses, um, uh, dental care, prescriptions, um, and durable medical equipment, including hearing aids. And so that's for people of all ages. And so and it doesn't have to be anybody in a school. If you would just have a neighbor um, that you know is in need, um, you're welcome to, to go to our website. And so now I'll let Melissa take over. So thank you. What's her job?
Um, so last year was our first year, and we got $12,500 last year, which is amazing, and we appreciate that greatly. Um, last year with our funds, we bought some new updated equipment that we desperately needed in the clinics. Um, we bought some new blood pressure machines, some new pole socks to check the O2 stats on kiddos. Um, just things that were really kind of ancient and we needed just some new and updating. Um, we've seen great things with that equipment, less time spent in the clinic, um, less 911 calls that have had to come out because our equipment's actually working properly and we're getting accurate numbers. Um, so we truly do appreciate that. And then this year we got a $18,743.25. Um, and this year we got a few different things. So we got um, an additional spot screener um, because we do go through, the district nurses go through, and we will screen um, any kid's vision who needs it um, for a sped eval or any of that. We also do all K, 1, and 3. Um, so every kindergartner, first grader, and third grader gets their vision checked. Um, so we got an additional one of those. Um, we got, you want to draw a blank? We got audiometers. So we got 10 audiometers. Um, we partner with Score One and Cerner um, who come into our elementary schools. Score One does five of our schools, Cerner does the other five. Um, their great programs are just a little different. Cerner, as part of their screening, does hearing screens. So five of our elementary schools were getting hearing screens, and we had five that were not. So we bought hearing screens for all of them. So all K, 1, and 3 at all schools will get hearing screens now. Um, so that will start in the fall um, when we roll over, which will be amazing. And then we also spent the extra money and got um, emergency um, albuterol asthma treatment medicine. Um, that's the biggest thing we have to call 911 for is a student is in respiratory distress and we don't have any medicine to give them because they're either out or the parent never brought any. Um, so now we will be able to administer that medication to help open those lungs so that kids don't have to go 911 and they can be better and wait for the parents to actually come and pick them up. So that's going to be huge for us um, because that's one of the big things that we see in the clinic, especially going into the spring. Lots of asthmatics um, when the allergies start flaring up. Um, so we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Grant. <laughs> All right. Now, now, a few items tonight. We'll start with the legislative update. Um, we're tracking over 200 bills. Obviously, not all of those are going to be making it across the finish line, but there are some that are already on the Senate and the House calendars to be debated. Some have been debated and laid over. Um, on the Senate side, Senate Bill 649. This charter expansion into uh, municipalities of 30,000 uh, individuals or more, and also first class counties. Uh, Senate Bill 581 is a voucher tax credit program, which will siphon away 25 million out of the public uh, fund or the, the general fund of the state over 10 years, so it's more of like a $250 million expense. Senate Bill 525 is a Charter Recovery High School Act, and that was the one that was actually debated on the uh, Senate floor. It was filibustered by a uh, bipartisan members of the Senate, and it was eventually laid over, but could be brought back at any time. Now, all these bills, you know, on the House side, they have sister bills that accompany those, that the ones that I just read, but they don't have the votes in the Senate to pass them out right now. So they'll, they'll be spending a, uh, the next week, two weeks, of whipping those votes to see where they're at before they bring it up for a final vote. Um, on the House side, there are some uh, additional tax bills and capping the property assessment bills or property assessments at anywhere from the CPI to, or I should let me back up, anywhere whenever you purchase the home, it stays that way until you sell it uh, or capping it up to 15%. Uh, we may get one of those, we may not. We'll see as time goes on. They will be argued or debated on the House floor. The Senate also has the same type of bills uh, on their side. Any questions? There's a lot of things out there. They're getting ready to go on spring break. They move quickly, but as Jerome, I was talking to Jerome Barnes last week at the uh, Academic Honors Night, they have slowed to a crawl uh, as far as, as bills going forward. We are, they're filing for election, uh, obviously right now, 
and we'll see where that goes, but that could be part of that issue. But you can guarantee, guarantee that once they come back from spring break, they will fire up again and be rolling to get to the finish line, particularly with it being an election year. Eight point five uh, in school, out of school suspension. I wanted Dr. Huff to address the board a little bit tonight because our middle schools um, are, are considering implementing uh, a program to combat some of our OSS ISS numbers through restorative justice. And we talked about that here on this board. And I wanted Dr. Huff to kind of bring us up to speed so the board knew where we were at. Uh, I was dealing with the uh, number of OSSs as a multifaceted approach. And we've talked about that numerous times about the different uh, social emotional programs that we're bringing for our students, uh, the focus of our cultural competency committee, and the trainings that our teachers are going through. Uh, one of the facets, though, is this close investigation of restorative practices. Uh, it's actually changed its name from restorative justice to restorative practices. Uh, we, all our three of our middle school principals went to a two day session here uh, a week or so ago, and we're very impressed. Uh, with what uh, that presentation was, we have set up for all of our secondary principals to take a team to go to a session at the beginning of June. Uh, a two-day session is offered at our uh, Regional Professional Development Center, UFKC. <coughs> our desire is to see if we are operating under best practices to offer the very best environment for our students to be able to uh, you know, stay in school. And so restorative practices, in short, is about recognizing that one, first, adolescents are adolescents, and, and sometimes adolescents do adolescent things. And what we're trying to do is teach students, uh, not only the academics, but also proper behaviors. And sometimes it takes teaching over and over and over again. And also understanding that students bring uh, with them, uh, when they come to school, they bring uh, a lot of their baggage that comes along with them as well. And, and some of our students have quite a bit of trauma in their background. And that's part of what our cultural competency is driving at, is understanding what students are bringing to the table. It's part of what restorative practices also brings in. And it's about trying to meet the students where they are, bring them along to where they need to be. And the restorative part of it is, is restoring those uh, relationships that they may have damaged with whatever behavior that they had. So as a, for instance, a student chooses to be disrespectful in the classroom. Uh, rather than just automatically send that kid home, uh, we do have some separation away from the classroom, but then there's a re-entry back in, restoring that uh, relationship with the adults. So we're really hopeful this is going to be a good program for us. Uh, like I said, we're not uh, tying ourselves to it completely yet. We're in the investigative stage, but we do think that it has some, some strong merits. I will say that one of the things that has been worrisome to us in going this direction is it is time and staff intensive. And so we have to take a look at the practical nature of this program as well. We do feel that it's very strong, and so we're going to take a look at what we need to do to make it work. I had a question. I had a question. Um, that sounds great, Dr. Huff. <laughs> it's good. Um, because, is it true though, isn't it true though, we that would be the, this restorative practice and getting back, making their way back to the classroom if they were out, would be a job of the interventionist? Uh, well, it could be a job of a whole lot of people. An assistant principal, could be a counselor, could be counselor. a principal, could be, a teacher, could be a lead teacher. We, we need to see, figure out some way that we can make it work for us. Um, and yes, it certainly could be the job of an interventionist. You know, we eliminated some of our intervention jobs, and yes. do you see that maybe we need to think about bringing some of those, increasing those again? I, I will say that anytime you deal with social emotional issues, it is time intensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, like anything, uh, say when you're building a house, the last 10% of building that house takes an enormous amount of time because it's that, that really detailed finish work. Students are a lot the same way. Uh, working with 90% of our students uh, doesn't take nearly as much time as working with the 10% of students. And the 10% of students, you know, from being in the classroom, it just, they, they take a lot of your time. And, and so yes, it is staff intensive. And we also have a need for a high, high level of expertise for those staff members to be able to work these programs properly. It's something we probably need to keep in mind then, as far as staffing goes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to uh, 
wrap my head around. I was going through each one of the reports, uh, one of the spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are really fun. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I think some of the things I would like to know, um, like for instance, I see the numbers, but how many different students, or how many of the same students does that represent? And, uh, and then, once again, looking at the subgroups, it uh, seems like a lot of our, maybe, you know, when we look at staffing and things like that, a lot of uh, the clusters, 8th, 9th, and 10th grade, and, uh, and um, but also the buildings and the, uh, and the teachers or whoever, the interaction, who's having those, is there some of the same teachers along with some of the same, with some of the same students? Um, and then, how long are those students who are having those problems been in our district? Just, just to be able to identify, just to kind of get an understanding of, because when you look at the numbers, you just say, wow, we increased from last year. And what, was, what is that reason? Is it because we had more students, these students move in, or is it, is it something going on internally in the building, or whatever, whatever it is? I don't think we can discern that between with these spreadsheets. And then um, I did write down requirements to return. Do they just come back after you got two day suspension and you just walk back in and that's it? Um, and maybe not just a requirement for uh, the students, but also the parents. Just to come together to make a plan for, for a student. And then uh, the, my last thought, I know I said a lot of things, but <laughs> so my last thought is the test scores. Um, how is this affecting our test scores? Are these, are their students, are these students, the scores that we actually look at, the reading, are these, are these students struggling in those areas uh, where our scores are low? I would venture to say yes, but that would be, I don't know if you already have that information of all this stuff, but that's stuff I guess we as a board can look at to try to figure out where best that we can make some decisions to try to help in this area. So just in general, uh, I'll tell you that we have evaluated all of those things um, from time to time in the past. Now the reports you have are definitely not that specific. And those are all excellent points and suggestions and, and questions. Uh, our Citizens Advisory Committee did go through and look at several aspects of that. Uh, not all the aspects of what you just mentioned. Uh, and some of the answers are rather obvious, just as a for instance. Um, the correlation between students with high disciplinary incidents and their test scores is there's a strong inverse correl correlation there. Right? The higher the incidence of OSS, the lower test scores. But not always. It's not a direct correlation. It's not a complete correlation. Uh, some of our uh, very intelligent students um, do things that they really shouldn't do. Now, after a period of time, if a student misbehaves long enough and is removed from the classroom long enough, there starts to be a stronger correlation because they're not getting the instruction that they should get. And so there's also a good strong correlation between time out of classroom and success down the road. So we definitely see a strength in that. And just as a society, we offer a, a life-changing service for students. Students who graduate with a high school diploma, and particularly students who graduate from high school diploma with a high skill set, are much more successful in life. And that, as a society, is just better for us down the road because those students have a much low, less likelihood of incarceration, much greater likelihood of contribution. So it all gets very important to us. And so in the end, do we want our students in the classroom? Yes. And we need to do whatever we can to keep them in the classroom as much as possible. The other side of it, though, and you know, this is a, you know, a dichotomy, the other side of it is that we also want classrooms that are going to be uh, good for everybody, you know? You don't want chaotic classrooms either. And so you don't want to sacrifice chaos just to make to say you have students in the classroom, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we want both. We want outstanding classrooms and we want everybody in them. We're selfish that way. So we're working towards that goal. So are those reports or something that I could receive? So what you can do, and I have no problem doing this, is email me something specific that you're interested in, mm -hmm. um, and I will work on it. Sometimes it takes some time. And you remember uh, a board meeting, there's actually I think a special board meeting that uh, Bobby had asked for some specific information, no problem. We've been working on it because some parts of it have been difficult to pull, and we'll get that information out. So 
just email me anytime and I can pull that information. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it takes some time. But we'll get it done. Mr. President, um, following up on his comments, which I think were excellent, and we, each of us looked at this data and, and came up with different conclusions and some similar conclusions. And, and mine were, were numerical. Um, th what I found was that in the month of February, on the, the uh, building uh, report, ISS and OSS in school and out of school suspension report, um, we had uh, 2013 middle school uh, kids, and uh, we had 657 cases of in school and out of school suspensions in the month of February. So that's, uh, and that's up from 350 in the prior year. So it's close to double. Uh, in, in the high schools, we have 2,500 students, and we had 898 in school and out of school suspensions, if I'm reading this right. 528 were out of school suspensions. So this is the, I'm not sure where you're at. The building. Uh, so are you, I'm looking at the ISS by building report. Yeah. So on the left, does it have the buildings all listed? It's, it's, got, it's got all the buildings and it runs it through, uh, it shows 1819 uh, comparative to 1920. And in, in it, this column says 335 OSS cases. Am I looking at it? Let's make sure we're, okay, you're looking at that right there. Right. Well, and you're looking at the toll for all the middle schools there. No, that's for that is the that's the toll for 18, 19, 19, 20. Okay, I just wasn't sure which report. Yeah, you're yeah. At. Okay, so so it, it it if that's the case, um, if we have 898 cases of in school and out of school suspensions in a 20 day month of February, that's 45. Examples a month, or a day. Excuse, sorry. excuse me. What is this? This report indicates that middle school had, uh, in February, a total of 173 days of ISS and 61 incidents of OSS. The February, report. February, out of school suspensions. This is the report I've got. By building. I think you're looking at you're probably looking the, the overall, year yeah. the whole year, several years total. Yeah, I think you're looking at multi-year. Multi okay. Okay. Just follow it. At the bottom it should be a total. All right, of that's the, is, that a, is that a running total? Yeah. yeah. So if I took 130. This, this one is the month, this is the current year. It's a different report. And it's titled March 2020 ISS OSS by building report. That's what I'm looking at. <coughs> oh, it does. Well, what you're looking at though is, is uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're looking at. Days instead of incidents. So, days. Right. So that's uh, if I have a 10-day OSS on this report, that's okay. 10 days. On the other report, it's uh, one. Okay. So so so, one, so some are by by incident, some are by assignment, by days. Out. Okay. So we had we had 335 out of school suspension days. Yes. And 322 out of school suspension days. 322 in school, or in 335 school. out of school. Does that strike you like a big number? Am I missing okay, so, something? Um, I will say this, that the we had a larger number of in school and out of school suspension uh, for that month for middle school. Yes, we had an increase from the prior year. And so the other report to look at... Uh, but, but the other thing, uh, bear with me. You're okay. The other is we had the same pattern on high school. We had 528 days uh, OSS and 370 days ISS, and that's uh, double what it was in the prior year. Does that strike you? Is that concerning? So, yes, is the answer, the short answer. Um, it's not the complete story. Uh, sometimes we'll have fluctuations within a month, and sometimes it, discipline incidents can come in rashes sometimes. For instance, you might have a fight that involves numerous people. Um, if we had a, I, I tell you, one of the schools, we had a fight that involved four or five kids. 
They all got 10 days of suspension, some of them got more than that. And so that can abnormally impact a single month's report. But if you look at the whole year, um, so as, as a, for instance, if I look at the high school for this entire school year, the number of OSSs last year was 312 at this point in time, and so far this year is 254. So those high schools are actually reducing. Uh, they're actually fewer this year than last year. Even though the month of February was not a particular month, overall the high schools are looking okay. The middle schools, uh, we actually do have an increase of OSS from last year to this year. We had 307 incidents to this point in time. Last year we had 346 incidents to this point in time this okay. year. So there is an increase there. And yes is the answer that whenever we see these sorts of numbers that show these kind of bubbles of increase or decrease, it's important to us. And we try to figure out why. Well, then, then back to Amy's point. Um, we did make some pretty significant changes in intervention. And we're talking about the budget for next year. <laughs> um, I haven't heard, heard anybody say we, we got that one right. And people that I've talked through the district, they would say that was pretty tough, um, particularly when you're trying to keep your class going and you push one out and somebody's got to deal with that child and that anger and that moment that kids do things. And so I'm just wondering if we shouldn't reflect on the intervention question, the staffing question. Is that, it would, I understand we've got an, another modality, another protocol, okay. But in the meantime, is it, is it, does, it, does it make sense to look at the number of support staff that we have to help the teachers and the child uh, reconcile his or her views to what's a normal situation? And the answer to that is that when we have the number of interventions that we had a couple years back, uh, they were definitely doing a nice, a bang up job and they were meeting with a lot of kids, there was a lot of proactive behaviors that they were able to take care of. Uh, in other words, they, they recognized that something might be brewing, they talked to students to get them to calm down, to be you know, successful in the classroom, no doubt. Uh, we have had to make choices about, uh, about budget over the last couple of years at, at, with a reducing uh, number of students, and reducing the amount of budget that we get from the state. <laughs> So yeah, that's certainly part of it. We, we did know that there would be an impact. As a matter of fact, any staff member we would take out, you know, not just interventionists, we, uh, any, any number of them, I can make an argument that that hasn't made an impact. Uh, even the, the instructional assistants in our, our reading classrooms at the, at the elementary level, or you know, with our reading specialists, I'd, I'd argue that that makes an impact and not have those folks around. So the question we have to answer is, to what degree is this impact affecting us and is it worth to you know worth it for us to divide to, to divert more money towards that particular staffing uh, increase? And you know that's obviously a very difficult uh, decision to make. And we have done this for now one year. And you know do these numbers point in that direction that you know maybe there's a negative impact? They could. Um, it's also a very complex question to say you know what is impacting the numbers of this. Uh, for our discipline. I would hearken to say that the decrease in interventionists is certainly having an impact. And whether it's the impact, or, you know, the major impact here, that would be up for discussion. And, and I would, and I appreciate your commentary, and I'll get off this. Uh, I, I, we are talking about the budget. That was not an issue on the budget, and uh, the recommendation for next year. And I strongly urge us to put a placeholder there that we can, as a board, uh, discuss after we have a few more months of activity because um, I, I think our financial condition is substantially better than it was a year ago when we made those cuts. So I think we ought to reflect on that. Indeed. Does that make sense? It does. Mr. President, yes. I just want to make a comment uh, because I've had this discussion practically for the number of years that I've been on the board, but one of the things that, and I've expressed this to you, Brian, that disrespectful, disruptive speech and behavior is such an open uh, subject that it's up, a lot of it is up to the judgment of the individual that's making the judgment call. And there is no direction, no directive, no guidelines, no uh, suggestions to help a person because sometimes we come in with a bad day and a student might do something that 
may not be disrespectful, may not be disruptive, but because of the fact that where we're at might be called that, and that's a, an incident against the student. I really would like to see us, I, I really am uh, feeling positive about this subject and about what the district has done thus far, but I really would like to see us to give some quality time to this subject like even if the board is in agreement with this for a real work study where we come in we come with ideas to help the district in the sense of making some of those uh, decisions with regards to this because this is an opportunity for this district to really shine if you can come up with something that benefits students that are at risk that that are having behavior issues and that something works well for this district it could be a positive thing that could work well for other district just like we did with our curriculum with dr uh <laughs> what's her name Hi. 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 <laughs> yes so it, it was it, she did such a positive job with that that it became something that that the uh msnb msnba embrace so I'm just saying, I, I think we're on the beginning stages, but we need to devote time, and as, as Mr. Cody says, we need to also devote money, because whatever we want, and we know this is true in the district, we know this is true in our own personal lives, if we want it bad enough, we'll make the sacrifice, we'll give the time, we'll do whatever we have to do to get it there. So I'm just hoping to see that we will make some kind of headway in that area with, with regards to disrespectful, disruptive uh, speech and behavior that we give some kind of uh, picture, a uh, vision for uh, teachers to have to go by. I might say too that all, all that I talked about, the, it is difficult to further define that category because kids' behavior is unpredictable. It's a, it's a variety of things. We were to sit down and look at what 100 kids did that were coded as disrespectful. You know, you couldn't put your finger on any major categories. But what you can't put your finger on, though, is that relationship between students and, and kids, or students and, and adults. So from the cultural competency side, it's about understanding who a student, what a student you know, brings to the table, who a student is, the, the variety of different backgrounds that they bring. Uh, when we look at uh, you know, at-risk behavior, it is definitely connected heavily to students who have gone through trauma. And so understanding what a student in trauma brings to the table. And, and that sometimes a student behaves the way they do because of little things, which are not little, but a fight with mom that morning. And I'm a different kid that day. Restorative practices gives us some ability to have those conversations without necessarily just kicking a kid out. So what you're saying there is, is right in the sweet spot of what we're shooting for. Because we believe heavily that is relationship based. Those sorts of categories are relationship based. We are we are right there with you, Bob. Well, I think it's a good idea. I think what you were actually asking for is maybe have a work session where we, because you know we've already spent a lot of time talking about this tonight. But if we had a work session where we had more time to talk about more detailed stuff. Yeah. You know, so let's think about a time where we can do that, and maybe you could also email me some like specific things that you would want to talk about during a work session like that. Yeah. Well, that's a complicated issue because you know, even if we come up with great ideas and things and, and ways to help, help kids with what we want to do, then other people interpret that, oh, well, they're not even doing discipline anymore. You know, and that, you know it's all uh, goes together. If we can save a child, I mean, if you can save a child from a, from a destructive pathway, I think it's well worth it. Yes, let's see if it's the most important thing we do. Our, our numbers have, have increased, I would say, though. Um, we've had 500 more days of in-school suspension and 45 more days of out-of-school suspension <coughs> at the bottom of that sheet. So it's not the direction either. So. Right. But I'm in agreement with Ms. Bobby as well. I'll jump down to 8.11 South High School Auditorium update on that. That's something we've been working on for several months now. Um, I am happy to say, you already know this, but the insurance company is going to pay to repair the entire west section of that wall. Uh, change order has been put into place. Travis, you want to elaborate? Uh, 
further? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the center section demolition, demolition is uh, expected to start in the week. Um, we're, we're submitting a demolition plan to the city. Andy approves that sort of thing. So we've got to get that. As I mentioned, um, you know, the way that wall was built after we dug a trench, we realized uh, that not only is the wall not connected, but it doesn't have the, uh, what's the, the... It has uh, a foundation, but it doesn't have a footing like we foundation, were foundation, but not a footing. So uh, we, we are having to change our engineering plans a little bit. So it's one of those things every time we uncover it. But, uh, you know, that doesn't change what the insurance will or will not do. It just changes that we've got to fix this before we can move forward. So, uh, in theory, they'll start next week on the actual work, but we'll start demolition of one section, move on to the next section, and they'll start building up the first section that we demo, you know, just kind of work their way across. So, uh, still expecting uh, a May 15 uh, completion. If weather's great, it could be April 5th, but uh, safely you can say May 15. I know the school school gets out uh, five days later, but uh, still got stuff we're doing in the summer and those sorts of things. That these people they use this thing all year round. So uh, Raytown Arts Council will need to use it. So very excited that we'll be getting this thing back open. Questions on that portion? Of it. Okay. Uh, you also have there um, an attachment that. A long-term solution for the South High School Auditorium and Gymnasium, uh, along with a potential Raytown High School uh, Gymnasium, uh, a bond issue and some funding scenarios. The board asked us the last time to come back with some funding scenarios during the months, and you can see that we started at the earliest of August 2020. Bond issue, the board would have to approve the bond next month, notify the Board of Elections in May. Uh, that the election would take place in August 2020 with the <coughs> approval required. At that time, we figure we have about 19 million in bonding capacity with the projects 14.7 million on the South High Auditorium, Auditorium and Gym, with another seven and a half um, budget for an auxiliary gym for Raytown High. So that brings it to about 22.2 million in projects. And as you go down, there's uh, November uh, 2020, uh, you can see that the bonding capacity uh, is about the same. Project's about the same approval rate. That is a general election, November 2020. You can see the timelines as well. Um, on the February 21, notice that the approval required goes from four sevenths to two thirds in February. February is the only month of the year where every year, whether it be odd or even, requires a two thirds passing according uh, to Missouri statute. Uh, you also notice if you flip down past April and go to August of 2021, in odd number of years, the months of August and November are at two-thirds approval required rate, uh, like February is. You can see there's more funding scenarios there. Um, the earliest we can do it, August two, 2020. Um, the latest you can do it, uh, there may no be into that. Into that, we have here on April the 22nd a uh, bond issue. In my mind. Um, you know, I feel like the earliest we might do it, and this is just my opinion, it can be changed. It's 2021, April 2021. We should have the plans ready to go at that point. We can start the campaign uh, and get rolling there. The latest, I have April 2022. That's just as I'm thinking through things. That may not be the same timeline that this board wants to have. So that's open for debate and discussion. That being said, let's discuss. I think it's a good starting point to look at those options. I don't think the voters this year is a good idea. That's my opinion, but I thought that's kind of the feeling of the board, but we can, we can always discuss that. But we were just to the voters last year. I don't think it's a good idea to go to them again for this year. I would agree with that. Yeah. I agree too. I like I I'd be in favor of April twenty one as the earliest. Mm -hmm. And again, as we discussed in finance committee meeting, these aren't set numbers. We'll see how much money we have saved from the entire bond package, and we'll include the one point eight that we already had allotted towards South High in the present bond. So 
you know, we're looking between three and five million dollars there. So, and again, if uh, we're putting down, Sandy, help me what there are uh, things that detect wall being moved. Strain gauges. Thank you. Strain gauges. We're putting those on the north wall. Let's say they start moving, <coughs> and we have to shut down the, the auditorium. I mean, that I think moves up our timeline significantly. But at least we have the option to do so at this point. Uh, the idea is we still we don't expect that we don't have plans are not going to be ready to win, Sandy. Um, we're we're shooting for July. Okay, so we're talking about trying to run something out there in August when we're just getting the plans finished. Um, lots of things to think about. We'll do we have another committee meeting set at the school yet? No, uh, we'll have several more. Uh, we're actually looking at doing some side visits uh, Thursday. And if we don't get it set up for this Thursday, it'll be the, probably the Thursday we come back from spring break. Uh, it's all dependent on the school that's allowing us to come visit. So we're working with that. Some other schools that are. Yeah, we're looking at some other auditoriums and gyms in the metro area that we can visit uh, for the team to look at examples of things that we've talked about designing into the new additions so they can see them. See if they think that that would work for the new, for the new spaces. Okay. And you'll email everybody so, when, when those. I'm looking at Thursday afternoon if I can get responses back from the other schools in time. Mr. President, yes. so if the wall, north wall, doesn't is it moving? Are we uh, are we uh, thinking about using that two, three million dollars to in the uh, auditorium? The plan, plan now is. To that $1.8 million that we have allocated for bond improvements to make improvements that will that we can transfer to the new building, uh, whatever that may be. Technology, so, for example, like a, you know a new projector system that could then be moved to the new auditorium. But other than that, uh, nothing to the physical structure, uh, like not adding bathrooms at this time that we would just end up tearing down. And not repainting walls and putting in new carpet and things like that that we would end up just tearing down. But a, a new auditorium wasn't on the uh, list of projects. No. <laughs> we did not know that it needed to be at the time. So it's on the list of projects because of the wall. Correct. And if the wall isn't moving and we got a new west wall, why do we need a new auditorium? Well, we still have the issue that the north and the east wall are uh, have, were constructed inappropriately. And just like we discovered, the, there's no footing uh, under the foundation. <coughs> there, there, it's likely that that is the case for these other walls as well. And it's not a question of uh, if, it's probably when those other walls begin to structurally fail. Wind, wind load or no wind load. Uh, yeah. Then and I'm not asking saying I don't. I'm not in agreement with a new auditorium. I'm just saying, just in the, when we're thinking about sure. the next bond is well, how they, soon, that, how, how far out they can be. Well, the part of the uh, part of the logic in my mind is that it takes 18 months to construct that auditorium. Um, we could wait. We could wait until the, the north wall and or the east wall fail, uh, close the auditorium. You know then determine the funding source, of course, you know, depending on um, when when we could go back to the voters, we decided to do a bond, that, that would delay the funding of that project, and then once we secure funding, then it would take 18 months to build it. So, knowing that at some point we will need to construct a new auditorium, we want to be, I'll say, strategic uh, in our planning, both the financial planning as well as the construction of that facility. Yeah, okay, so that 2026 finance, that's not something that, that's we're really considering. Well, that, that is a consideration for this board. That was uh, brought up the last time. Uh, it, I, what I walked away from that last meeting was that this board would like, generally, would like to move sooner rather than later, and that's why when I prepare this document, I prepare the timeline that you see. I could, we could roll this out to April of 26, definitely. Um, and you could see the skeleton of that in, in that 
presentation on February 24th. But and that is an option for the school. And we're not really concerned about the east wall because it doesn't have the wind. Correct. Right. Correct. It doesn't have the wind, but it still has. It, it can still debond, for example, because it doesn't have uh, the, uh, the grouting uh, in the cells and the rebar in cells. Uh, the north wall does have some wind load above the vestibule, but not as much. We're not noticing any movement right now. Uh, I'll also say when we put the strain gauges on the north wall, uh, if those are moving, I'll turn that into insurance too. You know, so. Um, you know, that, that's a possibility. Is there any way to detect movement or debonding on the east wall? We can install strain gauges. We are installing strain gauges on the north wall. That is I mean on the east wall. Correct. And we can do that. Visually, we're not seeing that uh, type of situation, which then leads you to, to take the next step like adding gauges. but. We certainly can. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you raise an interesting question or an interesting point about the north wall. If the north wall moves, we apply for the proceeds from the insurance company and we can rebuild the north wall. Yeah, and so that mitigates the issue that you've described. I'm not convinced that we have the data to say either way that it's going to move or not move. Time will tell. This gives us. Now, doing the bond issue gives us time to do the measurement, uh, but the eventual, um, eventual situation, if it does move, we've had an insurance company that's paid for, for one wall of the same construction, it'd be a hard argument for them to make, but they're not going to pay for the, for the north wall. And I, and I uh, you know, some of, this, some of the energy in this thing can move, move pretty fast when people think they're going to get a new auditorium. Um, if we're not careful with how we handle that north wall, um, there may be some taxpayers. And this, this community is aging, as we know. It's a high medium, median age anyway. There may be some taxpayers that, that might challenge the assumption of building a new auditorium if we have a backstop plan for the north wall and or it hasn't moved. And so I would, I'd be a little cautious about about being optimistic about the an auditorium wall until we have all the facts, until we have all the facts, and two years will give us an opportunity for that to happen. Well, it, yeah, those are all good points, but there's a couple things that we're leaving out of this discussion that we can all talk about later. But but we're doing major upgrades at the auditorium at, at Raytown this year. So even if we built, the walls are stable and we stay in the auditorium we're at at South, there's no way to upgrade that, that room to ever be up to par to the one at Raytown because there's other structural parts of that room that are just not up to speed. Especially, I, I think you would say, what do you call the, the area behind the stage, the high? We don't have that. Right? We don't have that at South. So major things like that. The other thing is, I, I thought, I got the feeling at the last meeting that one of the reasons, one of the good things about being able to fix this wall and stay in the building is to be able to have the kids and all the programs in that auditorium while a new auditorium in a different location is being built. It, it, because if something happens and we have to close the thing down or, or if we wait four or five years and then decide to build it, after we've closed, then we have the same situation. What do those kids do for 18 months or so while all the building's out of commission? There's no right or wrong answer, you know, to, like I said, and that's, some, some of these things are no-win situations. And we don't know which, you will never know which one was the best way to go. Just as a reminder, too, um, there is a, an attachment to this board uh, agenda item that talks about what we would do for alternative locations. And all the scenarios would be very difficult. It's the, both auditoriums are heavily used, not just for plays. Uh, they are heavily used all through the year. And it would be a major negative impact on our programs if we had to find alternative places to do these uh, events. So.
I'm not sure. I didn't see the attachment. I may have overlooked it, but let's just double check and see. That so, was thinking so about SHS auditorium and alternatives. That was in regards to demo in the building, right? If we that was one of the options to it's just not mine. That's not a that's not a consideration anymore, right? Well, sorry, just had to get The demolition of the auditorium is not a consideration Correct. anymore. No, no. So when there's no need for out why would we <laughs> be without the space? I'm not understanding. We're hoping, that. We we hope that doesn't happen. Okay. So <laughs> Are we, are we considering maybe if the north or the east wall? Yeah, for structural done? failure. We structural to, failure? We had to close the building for safety reasons, like we like it is right now for some reason. Oh, I thought we were considering uh, demolition of the building as a, as one of the options, and that's why we're looking at other alternatives. But the uh, now that the insurance is paying for the west wall, and we got the strain gauges on the north wall, the east wall doesn't have the same conditions that the other walls have. I was just thinking that this, the demo of the building is not what we're, because we would know before and if that, that wall was to collapse, maybe we could fix that wall just as we fixed this one. I'm just trying to get a grip on how, where, when would we go to the, uh, and try to initial, do a bond issue. I'm just, that's my, that's only my question. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure That'll just that be out. up for us to decide. Yeah. That's, well, I'm just, that's the reason why I asked. All I've heard from this board, it seems like we agree on, is there's no interest in trying to go for one this current year, 2020. Mm -hmm. So we'll just keep moving forward. You guys are coming up with some plans, some more meetings, and you'll keep us updated on. Does the committee know about this? The, you're, you're going to go to some other? We discussed it at the last meeting, okay. and we're trying to finalize it. Okay. Well, let me know. I'm not trying to take long. <coughs> any, other, any other questions about any of that? 8.12 is the uh, Real World Learning Grant. We're in conversations and accepted in the Kaufman, um, I should say the Kaufman Circle of in, Dr. Huff's going to explain a little bit of that, but what the Real World Learning Grant is, it's high schools and districts in the metropolitan area have come together to talk about what the graduates need when they walk out of our high schools besides a diploma. Uh, and it's all centered around something called a market value asset. Uh, like, for instance, the Southland Caps is a perfect example with the teaching strands that we do. Those students are going to walk out with something other than a high school diploma. The kids that walk out of Herndon are, are a very good example as well because they're walking out of there with a uh, becoming a certified welder or nursing. They're, they've got something already besides that high school diploma. And what we're trying to do is, is create more strands within Southland Cap, but the avenue may, may be through uh, this real world learning grant. You want to expand upon that? But what it's caused is several of us, are, of us are going out and visiting different districts across the country uh, to see what they're doing, uh, to see what might work here that's working there. So. Yeah, the most important part of this to grasp is we want our students to walk out, all of our students to walk out with some sort of tangible skill to launch them into the next stage of their, of their life. And so that might be going on to college, might be going on to trade school, might be going straight into an industry, it might be going off to the military, it might be starting their own business. There's lots of different alternatives here. What we've found is that we do a great job with students who go to Summit Tech, Herndon, that sort of thing, with getting these market value assets. We are trying to find ways we can expand the offerings that we have within our, our comprehensive high schools. The place that we probably have the greatest foothold is on students who are taking dual credit. But what we're finding is that we, to, to tr call a true market value asset, a student should take uh, at least nine credit hours and actually have those credit hours at the university for that to actually be a market value asset. So a lot of our students take those classes but don't actually pay for them. So they don't get the credit. And so we are working on ways to, to help you know, students get that credit. You know, UCM is going to, we have a, a, a partnership with UCM, so they're going to, our students who have free and lunch can get that credit for free. Uh, just as an example. 
This grant is, we put in a grant for $75,000. $10,000 of that are to, is to do some exploring uh, with some model schools around, this, around the country. So we are going to four different cities during this uh, spring. Uh, San Diego, LA, Boston, and Indianapolis to take a look at model schools they have been on. Kaufman's paying for all that. What we're going to do is figure out where do we want to take a larger team next year. That's one thing, this ex exploring, visioning kind of trips to see what's out there because there's a lot of great things out there and sometimes we get a little bit myopic in what we can and can't do based on who we are. The other thing that we're going to do is we're uh, going to hire a staff member that's going to be our industry to school liaison. And it's developing those partnerships with industry so we can do internships, uh, we can do uh, real world uh, exp exploration activities uh, with those businesses in the classroom. We do a good job of that at Herndon. We have not had those, those uh, partnerships established well at South High and Ray High because it's very time intensive. And so this person will be able to establish those relationships. <laughs> So that's our goal for the next year, and we're hoping to come up with a much deeper plan. Not hoping, we're going to come up with a much deeper plan about how we can increase those MVAs, those market value assets across the board for all of our students. We're sitting right now at about 20% of our students are graduating from MVA. We'd like that number to be closer to 80%. So we have a, a rather audacious <laughs> goal ahead of us, uh, but we think it's very important for our kids. Some ways to reach that goal is through the Southland Cash Program, several of the districts south of the river, the Grand Valleys, the Grandview, the centers, they're also going through this uh, grant process with with uh, Kaufman and they they have different market value assets that they're looking at. Grandview, Grandview, for example, is looking at a specific machinist market value asset. They have, can't think of the company that's down there, uh, Honeywell is down there, uh, and the partnerships that they have with them, what, what better would it be to have them come into Southland Caps where our kids would have that opportunity to get into this machinist work we could offer them uh, whatever it may be, and welding is a big one. We already offer center or Grandview. They send their kids up to us. So why not bring all of us in together, as many as we can, and just create this? The teaching one has got me the most excited because we know what kind of uh, what kind of shortage there is in teachers, uh, and we're trying to combat that. But we can't do it on our own. We need to do it more globally, more regionally. So by bringing that all together, maybe we can get to that 80 percent that we'd like to. <coughs> and becomes a marketing strategy for our district. Come to Raytown, here's what we offer. Stay in Raytown, here's what we offer. Here's what you could walk out with uh, if you stay here. So, anyway. so one, of the, uh, one of the secondary influences that's happening uh, on this, which I, we should have seen it coming a little bit, but we're seeing an increased number of applications from Herndon because all the districts around us are doing this, uh, this Kaufman grant. And so everybody's focused on the MVAs. Herndon does a fabulous job of MVAs, which is the industry recognized credential. They all walk out with a credential. And so we're seeing an increased number of applications uh, for Herndon, which is fabulous. Uh, we're looking at expanding several programs at Herndon for next year. So it's great. So the grant's a one-time 75000 This is a three-year grant, three grant, and it is it is likely not going to be renewable. And so we need to get ourselves to a place where we can sustain whatever we put in the grant at the end. So it's 75000 per year per for three year. years? Right. But I think the sustainability comes with having more partners inside the consortium where we can share in the cost, uh, and not only share in the cost, but we can also share in the number of programs that kids could gravitate to. So it's going to be an interesting journey. One that I think can be beneficial to our students walking out. So where do you see this staff member being housed at? Herndon. Herndon. And so right now, uh, that staff member will be probably 80% focused on those relationships uh, within Herndon Caps. But then we're going to expand that to be more the ratio of being stronger the two buildings. So we need well, to take... That's what I was asking, because it, your, Herndon's already up there. They are, but it's maintaining those relationships. It takes a lot of time to keep those relationships and build those relationships. And then, so what we're going to do is we already have a pretty good string of partners. And what we need to do is a step one, keep those relationships going, and then spread them into the other into the other two buildings as well. And the other two, really other four buildings, because we're including RSA and Northwood in this project as well. So it's all of our high school kids. Um, and yeah, so we need to first off get that vision for what's going to go on in the two high schools, 
before we start just throwing partnerships at them because the part you all know if you're if you're out in business you're willing to make that partnership once but if you go out there and it's and it's not set you're not going to want to continue that partnership so right now the Herman partnership is set we need to work on getting the, the programs going at South High and Ray High and then develop those partnerships along the way. So that ratio is going to move from that 80-20 more towards you know, probably a 30-30-30 across the board. So. All right, I think we'll end it tonight on 8.14 and uh, something that's obviously on everybody's mind. You know what? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you go to 8.13? I can, yes. Street Outreach Team, Dr. Huff, and I believe we have Michelle here to talk about that. It's another support for our students that are homeless. Um, <laughs> okay. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, the Street Outreach Team, um, I'm excited that we've, we've connected with this because we I feel like we've kind of been missing connecting some of our kids who end up getting kicked out or, or they've left their home for some reason. It's the kid who got in a fight with their parent and went over to their buddy's house and they can't repair their relationship with their parent. Maybe they're living with their buddy. The street outreach team, what they do, it's a combination between Restart Synergy and Drum Farm. And um, you also see the safe place sign at the Quick Trip. If a kid were to go in there and say, hey, I'm here and I need a safe place, they would call the street outreach team and then they would help find them shelter for the night, figure out what's going on with them, help them get connected. Oftentimes when our high schoolers get kicked out of their home, they're kicked out without a social security card, insurance card, um, birth certificate, those type of things. So the street outreach team helps to keep, their ultimate goal is to help keep a roof over the kid's head. So for instance, kid get kicks, kicks out, let's say that Josh here is, is my good friend, I'm hanging out at his house. Parents are like, hey, but you know, you're okay, you can stay here. But like after three weeks, they're like, dude, you're a teenager, you're eating my house at home. <laughs> Street Outreach can partner and provide funding to go for food if that will help maintain that kid in that home. So they also have regular what they call drop-ins, and they will bring doctors and medical professionals to help kids if they need to get access to their prescriptions that they can't get access to. And so it's just, a, it's just another connection to a community resource that knows the community and those social services outlets. They can also, as kids start to age to 18, they will help them fill out the universal uh, transitional housing application that's online <coughs> between places like Hillcrest, Drum Farm, and um, those transitional restart even has their adult transitional living and so that they can help get those kids more stable and, and permanent housing. So, that the, the MOU will allow us if we identify some of those students to allow their street outreach person to come in periodically to the school, talk with that kid, check in with them, is there anything that you need? We've got this coming up, have you gotten this? And so it's just, just another layer that we can provide with some very specific supports for those kids. Thank you. And I'd like to emphasize it's another layer. We have added a lot of layers this year and we're very happy with that. We still have a long way to go. Um, another current relationship we're working on with Combat and um, Striving, and that one's coming up pretty quickly. We're getting that up and rolling here too. And a lot of it is for our it's for our students. So, thank you. Uh, item eight point one four is our coronavirus update. Um, you've seen some things in the news as far as coming from the CDC and the Jackson County Health Department. That's where we get most of our guidance from, uh, but we do have a pandemic plan in place, uh, ready to go. Uh, our biggest fear is the CDC comes in here and says you have to shut down, you have a, a, a presumptive positive, whatever they're calling it, uh, and you have to shut down for two weeks. Um, well, what are we going to do with kids for two weeks? Uh, we have a plan in place uh, as far as education at home, uh, what we can do through the web and what we all can what we can also do paper pencil with students but uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have about communications um, again we're taking this the, the guidance that you hear from the, the health department is it's like the flu uh, I see Charlotte back there you do the same things you do uh, uh, for the flu virus if you have an epidemic of the flu as far as cleanliness uh, maintaining hand washing etc uh, our custodians are continually uh, deeper cleaning than usual during this time. 
but um, it may get to the point, think about all the national contests that our kids are going to. Um, what if we get the call that you can't travel to Washington, D.C., or you can't travel outside of the state, you know, if it gets to that point. Uh, we have to be prepared for all of those things. Uh, we have been communicating with parents. We have uh, information posted on our website. Uh, we'll continue that communication, and that's all we can do at this point. Uh, we don't have, the, obviously, the testing ability. We don't have any uh, information that someone has tested positive uh, for this virus, and that's where we're at. But we wanted to make sure that we were here to answer any questions you might have. We asked Shirley to be here because she's in charge of our nurses uh, in the district and what they're doing. So at this time, we'd answer any questions. What uh, big one of the big issues also in the, in the news is has to do with uh, individuals that have to stay at home uh, being paid. Is that an issue here? If that should happen, that the school would have to close them. So. It if an employee, current employee, has uh, contracts any any illness, um, uh, they can take sick leave if they have that banked up. Um, you know, we would work with them, depending on you know, what the circumstances were, find a reasonable accommodation for that employee. What seems to be a reasonable given the circumstances. So, could someone work from home? Possibly. Could you know? Could an office, uh, someone in the finance office, work from home? Possibly. Uh, can a teacher work from home? That's obviously less less uh, <coughs> possible. I think in the case of being shut down. Well, I think also if, if we had, let's say we had a teacher, okay, that tests positive, um, I can almost guarantee that we would shut the entire. We'd have to shut the entire district down. Uh, everybody would be at home. Um, I don't see how we can have part of that. I don't think they would let us have. I'm saying this not knowing, but from what we're hearing. Now, there have been some schools that I don't know if they've had the, necessarily had a coronavirus patient, but uh, they've had them around them, uh, maybe not exposed, but they are continuing, they're, they haven't canceled school. Some have. Uh, this board might have to make a decision at some point to where if we do shut down for 14 days, do we uh, make people use their sick days? Or what do we do? I think you got to think about what's Desi going to do, okay? Uh, when we ask Desi, all right, we just dismissed 14 days, and this could could be uh, this could affect many things. One, uh, our attendance obviously attendance means money, right? Okay, but what about attendance 14 days of instruction and bumping right up to MAP testing and EOC? Uh, what happens then? A lot of questions that we don't have answered at that level to this point. But just knowing that if if the CDC came in here and said you had a positive test, you would have to shut down. I don't know what recourse we have to stay open. So are we communicating with Desi asking? I mean, does Desi have a plan? Is Desi, Desi has the same plan that the Jackson County Health Department has. If you get the, they, don't, they haven't looked at what are we going to do for attendance? What are we going to do for testing? Um, I think they're a wait and see approach. That's what they've got. One so thing that was the on the news <laughs> on the news today was a possible federal plan that would pay people. Yeah, but, but you have to be a, at a certain level, though. Yeah, but that was a federal. <clears throat> well, I would just make one one request because nobody knows what's going to happen with any of this stuff. I know you may have to take action, and I know when, like, when we close for snow days, that's your your call. But if at all possible, I would like for this board to meet if it comes time for a decision to close the school to have a discussion before that final decision is made, and we can go forward. Yeah, by phone. Mr. President, I mean, I, I appreciate that we're doing taking a wait and see. I appreciate that we're waiting for the CDC uh, to do something, but, but there are some obvi obvious questions. Uh, <laughs> by way of example, a kid goes to spring break in Colorado and hangs out with some people there and he comes back and, and he's got a sniffle and he's test positive. What are we going to do? Are we going to think about whether uh, it comes in the building and he's now been in the classroom for a day and he's sniffling. What are we going to do? I mean, I don't know if Desi's going to, Desi um, needs to get in the way of, of working through those risk scenarios uh, so that we're prepared um, that we don't have to sit around and uh, call a meeting and spend eight hours to kind of figure out what the scenarios are. I mean, those are the, 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 the obvious case that a kid's going to pick up 
kid or uh, teacher is going to pick one up, how are we going to react? Are we going to are we are we going to send the kid home for 14 days? What is our protocol? I mean, it seems like we could spend we could it would not be an, an, an unreasonable thing to do to look at the few of the scenarios and start building out some templates of how we're going to react. Well, I know I, 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 that's what we that's what we had to do. Do we have that's if a kid so if a kid comes back from spring break, what are we going to do with well, the with sniffling in the classroom? We so have that we have that laid out. Well, if they're sniffling in the classroom. Sniffling in the classroom and testing positive for the coronavirus. If we're, going to, we're going to suggest that they. But if they have fever, it's just like the flu. If they have fever, they present fever. We're going to suggest that our current policy is you have to be fever free for 24 hours. Uh, we don't know. We're under no mandate to send them to the CDC or the Jackson County Health Department. I'm not so sure. Even if we did, I don't think we could keep them out of school uh, if they did. If they did present those things, other than the fact that they have a fever. Okay. I, I don't know enough about this virus, as it, and maybe most people don't, whether it presents with just fever only or fe no fever, whatever the case may be. Um, the question becomes, do we have the ability to keep that kid out of school until they get tested? I don't know. I don't know. No. We do not. You can't do that. You can't force them to go and do it unless you're willing to pay for it, mm -hmm. which that would be a lot of kids to be paid for. Uh, our policy is simply if they are they are running a fever, they have to be 24 hours fever free without medication before they can come back and be in a seat. And so that's the same thing you would do with any contagion like the flu or cold. You want those kids to be non-contagious or a state of if they're diagnosed with that. We have a lot of kids that I believe do have the flu sometimes, but they don't go to the doctor. We can't make them go. Because the only reason that we, when they, we might make a suggestion if they're wearing high fever for several days, that, you know, that's for my kid, you know, I might want to take them to the doctor, but that's about it. A lot of parents will write it out at home and they're never diagnosed. And that probably, to be honest with you, is going to happen with this virus. Because a lot of people are going to go on vacation spring break. They're not going to come back and tell you that they have the coronavirus. They're not going to do that. And 90% of them will not go get tested. It's not going to happen. So we have to ask ourselves how we manage the unknown. Because it's a lot of unknown about this. Truth be honest, the virus, what do our doctors tell us every time we go to the doctor when you have a virus? They will tell you. Treat symptoms, it's going to run its course. They tell you that all the time. They tell you that with the flu, they give you a flu, they send you home. But as a district, I think there should be some sort of plan of action that we take. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just can't see us just waiting for the incident to happen and then start scrambling trying to figure out what to do. We, we, if you look, click on that, there's a, there's a pandi pandemic uh, continuing the plan for the Raytown C2 School District. Yes. That's the steps that we will follow. It's a 25-page document starting with the, the objectives, planning assumptions, the operations team. Um, just with, like uh, Ms. Hurley said, we're going to have a lot of kids that have the flu regardless. Do we institute this plan just because of that? No, we don't. Uh, the question becomes, when, it, when does it become an epidemic? If we all of a sudden we have 82% oh, of our kids are out, uh, that may throw up a red flag. Or if we have someone from the Raytown area that has pre uh, presented positive, then it may be, they may take a closer look. We may take a closer look. But we have a plan in place uh, if we have an outbreak. We don't know if we'll have an outbreak. We can't prevent an outbreak, okay? Other than the fact that maybe we can prevent it by telling our kids and our staff, make sure that you're washing your hands thoroughly every day, multiple times a day, uh, etc. And that's the same thing we would do for the flu. So what is our plan if someone says, I have the virus? Uh, then we would be contacted, we are required to contact the Jackson County Health Department. Without meetings, right? The CDC, yeah. yes. We are required to report any contagion like that, and then we follow their guidance. And I will tell you, the first thing they're going to do is put that student in quarantine away from us. If it's just in one building, I would think that that would be a suggestion. We're going to have to close the building 
and get like Surf Pro or somebody in here to clean it, like they're doing in St. Louis right now. They were down for one day, and they are they've gone through that with the experts, obviously to get it clean. Uh, and then I think you have to channel with what are the other connections with that spread, and if it was just that one building. Which Knowing the fact that there's multiple people probably going in and out of that building mm -hmm. to, to other buildings, yeah. including parents um, and visitors. Six, section 2 on that talks about act, no, activation and it lists five reasons we would activate the plan. And, and that's when we would activate the plan. Dr. Barkley alluded to one of them if we have 21% uh, absenteeism that's mm -hmm. uh, due to an illness. That's something we would probably cancel school for anyway. But um, if the uh, World Health Organization declares the pandemic is in phase six, increase in sustained transmission in the general population, then that is a, a moment in time which we would come together and activate this plan. And I will say, when we do activate this plan, we do have more latitude. We will and can uh, send people home and tell them not to come back for 14 days. We can and we'll do that if needed to. Uh, we will notice the doors. Uh, with that information and so on because when you're in a pandemic you you can take uh, more extreme action so but as uh, Miss Early mentioned if we do have like what happened in St. Louis where a father decides to go to the father-daughter dance even though he's supposed to be in quarantine and exposes the school and causes two schools to close I've been in contact with the Surf Pro we do have a scope of services that would meet the needs to um, close that building for a day, thoroughly clean it with the appropriate disinfectants, with the appropriate gear so as not to expose, like our, our custodians will not clean a coronavirus building. That's not gonna happen. It's a work comp concern and so on. We would hire this company to do it. And then we'd be able to open it the next day. I uh, heard Ms. Pulaski mention the school bus. That would be cleaned as well if the child rode a school bus. And while it's closed, the CDC will be investigating the connections to that student where other students exposed and so on. So while we're closed that day, that could turn into more schools being closed and clean and so on. It's, it's not something you can predict, but you can have a plan to work from, um, a plan to divert from, I like to call it. Uh, for example, if we have an intruder event, you know, we have an incident, incident command plan that shows where the helicopters will land, where the buses will come, we have it all on there. It's not going to go exactly like that, but we have a plan to divert from. We can say, okay, well, maybe it won't happen like this, but we can move it over here. And that's what this plan allows us to do. But it's, it it's specifically hits on all those aspects for business continuity so that we can continue the business of education. And whether that's distance learning, uh, reassigning employees due to extreme absenteeism, I might be driving a bus by the time it's all over. <laughs> And, I'm, uh, and I can be assigned to do that. Um, you know, uh, our HR person can do that. And that's outlined in this plan. So that's what this plan is for. We are nowhere near the need to do that, but we have it in place should we need to. Well, I, I mean, I looked at your section two under activation. Are you reporting that out? Is that yeah. correct? Yes, sir. And, and, uh, and uh, it says it, the plan will be activated when one or more of the following criteria are met. Number five is student employee concern regarding personal safety from pandemic exists. Yeah, that's a, that is a uh, subjective gate that we would have to gauge uh, a body like the Board of Education um, if, that, if the panic and concern exists to where we feel like there's a danger to the students and staff. Yes, that's a, that would become a reason to consider closing school. But I think that also cuts both ways because the concern that a pandemic exists um, might be in the minds of the parents and, and students, but it could be um, mitigated by um, a public discussion about how we're going to, uh, what we're going to do. Right, and, and, and allowing some of the, like the parents are going to say, what if, I, what if I keep my kid home because I don't want them to be subjected to the pandemic when this occurs, are you going to mark them absent? And, right. And that's the daily oh, yes. communications we've been sending out uh, that Danielle's been drafting up, sending out to uh, families to alleviate that panic. Notice it says one or more. It doesn't, doesn't have to be number five, and it's number five for a reason. It's the least 
li uh, likely reason we would do it. Yeah, number so. five could cost number four pretty easily. Yeah. Assuming the employee absenteeism is 21% or greater, um, you wouldn't even get to number five at that point because if you had that feeling amongst staff, you're going to be there. You're going to be at 21% or more. I'm not being critical. I'm just. I'm. I'm I think you've done. I just want to make sure that, that I feel you've done that. What's the prudent thing to do? Navigating uncertainty is very troublesome, right? Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have a plan, we'd say, well, wait a minute. I mean, time out. Think it through, and you've thought it through at least to the extent that you haven't thought of every, every case. Right. But you you this would this would clearly hold up a prudent man would say, hey, I did give this some thought, but I don't know what's going to happen per se. I'm not going to predict the, 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 you know, all the circumstances. Correct. So I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. I feel better about it. As, okay. as Donald Rumsfeld once said, there's yeah. no knowns, there's no unknowns, That's right. and there's unknown unknowns. Yeah. <laughs> and that applies to all this. That's right. And when it comes time to it, I agree with well, that. we're number one in the area for our safety. And, and I think this kind of falls under that, so, you know, kind of safety. So I trust you guys are coming up with a plan on what we're going to do. When it comes time to it, there's going to be stuff that we're forced to do that's out of our control, and then there's going to be things that we're going to make decisions. And the stuff that's in our control to make decisions, I want to have good rational discussions and not overreact. Yes. That's all I'm hoping that, that happens. Stuff that's out of our control, Nothing we can do about that. I, and just one last thing from my department that you know that we do monitor every contagion that's reported, and we have to uh, partner with Jackson County. Okay, every week we monitor that, and we also monitor, monitor the attendance attached to it. So if we have an outbreak <coughs> in a certain building, uh, I am constantly saying to Dr. Markley, "Hey, little blue is going down. We have these number of cases." Uh, that have been diagnosed at this site, what do you want to do? So we constantly monitor those things. All right, thank you very much. There was a time when all we really worried about was the milk and propane bids, but that, that time has passed. <laughs> I was a kid with a senior. Congratulations, come here. So. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the Benefits Committee. So the Benefits Committee met on February 10th, uh, prior to last month's board meeting, a uh, very <coughs> short, efficient uh, use of our time. We uh, discussed our claims experience for health insurance and dental vision, um, those products that, many of the products that we uh, offer to our employees. Um, we, at the time, estimated that our health insurance renewal would be somewhere between 10 to 15 percent for the coming year. We're going to talk in more detail here uh, later in the meeting about what that renewal is going to be. Also, we discussed the voluntary products that we offer in our district, uh, things like accident insurance, cancer insurance, uh, short-term disability, long-term disability, those type of programs. Uh, so uh, this. This visited and brought the board, kept the committee up to date on, on what we're currently offering and how our claims experience is going. Under new business, we discussed the timeline um, that we used to go through open enrollment. Open enrollment happened at the end of April, early May, uh, then benefits start July 1. We also talked about the employee assistance program and how our employees use the employee assistance program. Uh, first and foremost, they use it in, in great extent for social emotional health, but also they use it for legal and financial support or advice. Um, it's, a, it's a very highly used program in our, in our district. And that concludes the minutes of the report from the district. Thank you. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the March 9, 2020 consent agenda as presented.
there a motion to approve these policies? Well, <laughs> Mr. President, I move that the board approve policies as stated. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Any questions or comments? Have you guys policy committee met on all these? These these policies are a result of a change in state statute or federal federal regulation or federal law. And in those cases, they pass the um, policy review committee. They got them straight to the board for first read. This is the second. <coughs> health insurance. As stated uh, a little bit ago, we met the benefits committee meeting uh, and you have a presentation there uh, for uh, the sake of time. I'll just make like a synopsis of that presentation. The district is going to experience a 12.5% increase in health insurance premium. Uh, if you turn to page six, uh, Kevin, would you open up the PowerPoint of those two documents? Which one first? PowerPoint. This is PowerPoint. Thank you. 12.5% uh, increase to health insurance. No, no increase to dental, vision, or life insurance, uh, district paid life insurance. Um, you would scroll to page six in the PowerPoint. Well, if you can't open up the PowerPoint, how about the, there we go, thank you. All right, if you could, I'm going to try to keep it large as I can. So, you can see that on that particular slide that our uh, premium is going to increase to $734. Uh, the district paid portion is going to increase to $734 for a monthly health insurance premium for employees. Currently it's about $653, so it's a 12.5% increase. And you can see the other increases across the other, other plans. Uh, once again, dental, vision, and life insurance will all remain the same. So we're picking up the total cost, so employees won't pay any more for their, their employees. Employee. So the district is paying for the increase, so for the blue, for the high deductible, the qualified high deductible plan, the district pays the entire cost of that plan. Uh, for the base plan of 2,500 PPO, the district pays uh, all fifty dollars of that. The employee pays the fifty dollar uh, expense, and then you see the the buy ups of the fifteen hundred and a thousand dollar plans involved. That's good. That's fine. We're picking that up so they don't have to pay. But employee paying anything else like a family plan? No. How much time? And I know they're paying all that. But how how much of an increase are they having to pay over what they're already paying? Um, David, so the twelve point five percent increase for them. It's, it's, it's a twelve and a half percent increase at every rate. So the district is the district is paying an increase for the single employee. And how are that distributes through all so the So somebody with the family plans paying probably going to pay an extra hundred fifty dollars a month more than. Yeah, I, I mean it would be different for every plan. Some of them are close to three thousand dollars a month for some of those plans. The district is paying of their component. They're paying twelve and a half percent more than they did last year. One, one change we're making this year um, in the past, the district has paid five hundred dollars into the. Uh, health savings account. Make sure we're going to pay 750. Uh, try to incentivize more employees into the qualified high deductible plan. It's the most efficient plan we have in regards to claims experience. That's a good idea. Yeah. You need a motion? Yes, please. Mr. President, I move to accept the health, dental, life, and vision insurance premiums as presented. Second. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> no, hopefully that's one time. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Ms. Taylor. 
Oh, I, I apologize. I, I should have introduced Dave Johnson. Dave Johnson is with CBiz. CBiz is our insurance broker. Uh, we have had a long, uh, healthy, uh, very size word. It's been long <laughs> relationship. Very productive relationship with CBiz. Uh, as you recall, at one point we had 32 percent increase in our health insurance, and that dwindled down to a 7 percent reduction last year over time. Uh, you know, this year, obviously, that 12.5 percent increase is not welcomed, if you will. But with their support and guidance, we've done some remarkable things in regards to providing benefits to our employees. Employee health benefit being the probably the biggest. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Chip. Is there a motion for the approved mowing contract? Mr. President. I move that the <coughs> Board of Education approve KC Metro Lawn P-R-O-L-L-C as the preferred mowing vendor for the 2020 mow season at a cost of $75,500 with the options of four years of renewals at the cost of $75,500 for 2021, $77,010 for 2022, $78,550 for 2023, and $80,121 for 2024. Second. Any questions or comments? Have we used this company? Oh, no. Have we used this company before? We've not. Uh, they're new. I've called and checked all their uh, resources out. Um, they everything but it out well. Uh, they're substantially cheaper. Uh, so we're going to go with them if the event, something happens where they can't perform, we'll uh, go back to who we've been using in the past. There's substantial savings going with them. Okay. Do we usually get more bidders? Not this, no. Not for this. So our, our, our district employees will not do any mowing? We mow a lot. Yes, yes. we mow. You will still people. mow with this contract, too? Oh, yeah. We mow every day with that contract. Oh, wow. We have acres and acres. Someone usually complains when the grass is too tall in the Grand Junction. I have experienced that since I've been here. That's what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they'll complain about that. Well, so, I, I've been known to make a call or two. Uh, so, what areas does the district uh, employees mow? Then? So, we mow uh, like ISC, all the, all the things. That, the contract mowing is just the fronts of the buildings. So, all the backs of the buildings, all the fields, um, all the fence lines, uh, wellness center. Uh, all of those areas we mow. This company is owned by a Raytown grad. Correct. And lives in Raytown. That's good. To Just for information. That's good. <laughs> so we've had a separate mowing contract for many years. So. Correct. Sir. Water and safety swim lessons. Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education approve Aquatic Academy to oversee the swim lesson water safety program at the Wellness Center in the amount of $44,632. Second. Any questions or comments? It's the same company, right? Yes, yes, sir. Summer school. Mr. President, I move that the board approve 2020-2021 district summer school for grades K through 12. Second. I had a question. Okay. I guess, Andrea, do you know yet which elementaries will be 
I do. And seven years. Uh -huh. <coughs> I do. Um, I work for South High. And I'm switching South High this year, right down middle and South Middle. And then we'll have Eastwood, Westridge, Northfleet, Robinson, and Woodridge. Eastwood, Westridge, Northfleet, Robinson, and Woodridge to the elementary schools. We'll go back to Northwood with RSA and then we'll have a program in details. So do you just, you really just alternate each year, right? Mm -hmm. um, most of them. A lot of that gets based off of where we're doing uh, yeah. construction repairs. Mm -hmm. uh, what needs to be done. We, you know, we go ahead and we schedule all that out to make sure we have uh, yeah. time to get the least. So, so it's partly alternated and then depending on what they're going to be working on in the summer. Right. Selection of audit services. Mr. President, I move that the board accept the proposal from KPM CPAs and advisors chosen by the Finance Committee to perform the audit for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020 at a cost not to exceed $32,000. Second. Second. This was actually discussed in the Finance Committee meeting and this was one recommended by the administration and accepted by the Finance Committee. Any other questions or comments? the board approve this contract with Asso Grant Services for an amount not to exceed $50,000. Second. Any questions or comments? That's the same way that we met last month at the right. meeting. Yes, right. yes sir. Mm -hmm. We do the job. She's going to turn on the last one. Board of bid for District Lenovo devices. Mr. President, I move that the board approve CDWG for the purchase of listed Lenovo models through March 2021 with an init initial purchase of $800,076.75. Second. Second. <laughs> so we bought, we bought, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, didn't we recently buy these, uh, Lenovo's? Uh, Boy, it just seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Uh, purchased outside of enhancement grant, we haven't purchased computers since this time last year. So we buy them every year? We buy them every year. So for our one-to-one -one program, we buy one elementary grade level every year. The Chromebooks are on a four-year rotation. We buy middle school um, incoming sixth graders every year. Their fourth year, we use them to for parts and to kind of fill in where we need extra ones to help support K and one as well. And then high school, we buy freshmen every year. Right. So it's about seven hundred to seven hundred fifty thousand every year just in student devices, and then um, we have staff rotation and you know other devices around the district. So next year you'll see is a bigger staff rotation. So we fluctuate a little bit depending on what we need on the staff side or student side to stay pretty consistent. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> And the first read of these policies that are listed here. Any comment necessary for these tonight? Go through the uh, public policy review committee. Right. Anything else before we entertain a motion to adjourn? <laughs> yes. There is a discussion about whether to move the May meeting because it was the same week as we have. So we had graduation on Tuesday and Wednesday, board meeting on that Monday night. 
Uh, there was a request to consider moving the May board meeting to the following Monday on May 18th. Does anybody care or? Fine with me. That's okay. Is it good? Yes. Move that? Okay. We'll move the board meeting to May 18th. So we're not, we're not doing so. May 18th. The following Monday. So that way we don't get, get in trouble being at school stuff every night that week. <laughs> you have a graduate, you'll still be busy. Um, are we going to, you know, we're going to have to decide whether we're going to shake everybody's hand that night or not. Um, <laughs> you think? I hope you're right. <laughs> I hope. We'll do the, ed the education elbow. It's a very good question, though. Wow, that is a good question. I was thinking about that at Echo Night last week. Shoe tap. The shoe tap was popular. I'm kidding, boy. We just don't trip anybody going down the yeah, stairs. Not, <laughs> it's a lot of shoe tap. to greet you. Elbows. That is so good. Yeah, yeah. Something. Well, I thought we would think about that. Yeah, big We're doing empty, uh, thought about empty, uh, oh Yeah. Sure you can't have to go like this. Empty sure auditorium. Just don't bids anymore. Uh, I'm telling you. Just empty auditorium. Mr. President, I move that the board adjourn the regular board of education meeting at 8.27 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Did everybody vote on that before you shut down? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we've already lost control. Yeah, I have one more. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Wait, you want to talk about right now? Huh? You have something you want to talk about right now? No. <laughs>